apologies for the way my voice sounds. It's uh, still getting over the cold and the flu or whatever it is. I'm, I'm no longer sick officially, as I wasn't last time, but for some reason this, this cough has been kind of lingering for a little while. So appreciate your continued prayers on that front. Uh, last, last week uh, on Wednesday, or at least as the day of recording, I talked a bit about um, teaching tough topics in church, kind of ways to do that, uh, ways to kind of approach the issue, ways to be a good shepherd, uh, and so on and so forth with folks. Um, and before that, I talked about kind of a Christian understanding of, of politics and what 2024 is going to look like. Uh, as of today, uh, Donald Trump has swept through Iowa and is probably on his way to be the nominee, which means everything that we talk about over the next, <coughs> excuse me, 10 months is going to be filled with all sorts of nuance and stuff that we can only expect to come from a country such as this. So that should be very fun. One of the things I wanted to talk about today uh, in kind of dealing with tough topics is, is kind of twofold. One is preaching apocalyptic texts and kind of a principle for that. So let me let me uh, bring up one. I'll be preaching on 1 Peter 3, uh, 13 through 22. Uh, this, this, sorry, I'm jotting something down real quick. I, I, sorry, I... Uh, <laughs> We, we're doing it live, so to speak, and uh, all right, just making sure. The thing about being a pastor is you're always on call, which is, is wonderful. It's a gift of God. Um, <coughs> so one, so I want to do two things in this in this video. One is kind of lay out some ground rules and hermeneutics for preaching through apocalyptic texts. And the second is to talk about uh, the text I'll be preaching and apply it. Uh, and I'll be preaching on the famous um, baptism now saves you, uh, Christ making proclamation to the spirits in prison, uh, sanctify Christ as Lord, and all of those sorts of interesting texts in, in 1 Peter 3. And uh, just to kind of show how this all works, so to speak. Excuse me. Um, but the first, the first thing we got to do when, when talking about apocalyptic texts whether it's, um, I don't know, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, incredibly apocalyptic. Romans 8 sounds incredibly apocalyptic. Uh, the book of Revelation. And so, I, I mean, I would argue that the whole New Testament is essentially in, uh, saturated in apocalyptic thought. There's just, in my brain, there's no way to, to remove any of that from it. It's just that it's baked into the cake, so to speak. Whether they're, the New Testament is talking about sexual ethics, gender eschatology, Israel, you know, um, all, all these things are kind of baked into, or apocalyptic is kind of the spice that is baked into the cake, so to speak. But one of the things I, I found helpful in, in preaching and uh, engaging with apocalyptic text is, um, first is just don't run from it. Um, I've seen numerous preachers, um, when they come to those parts of the Bible, they basically run to the simplest text in there, camp out on that, and kind of go from there, uh, avoiding the apocalyptic elephant in the room. And while I, I'm sympathetic to the, the difficulty of preaching these texts, it's in our Bible, and at the end of the day, you are account of, accountable to, uh, to our Lord for preaching what's in front of you. And at the end of the day, I'm like, well, you didn't, didn't you read 1 Peter before you got there? Didn't you read Romans before you, you decided to preach through Romans? You know, Maybe perhaps a lot of pastors I know probably don't. I know enough pastors if, of, of larger churches that don't even do their own sermons or sermon research. You know, that, that stuff happens quite commonly. And so in my mind, it's one of the things, the very first thing you do is you're, you're, you, are, um, you are beholden to the text. You are not to run from the text. doesn't matter what the text is teaching you. It could be a very boring genealogy. It could be, <coughs> excuse me very boring, like I said, very boring genealogy, a very um, politically or culturally difficult text, like say Romans 1, or it could be something as controversial as the millennium. You know what I mean? It, it, you're kind of just stuck with the text in front of yourself. And at the end of the day, you're beholden to it and you're accountable to it. And so that's point number one is don't run from it. Uh, point number two is um, don't, uh, I, the one thing I've noticed is don't, um, 
try to do your own research. And what I mean by that is there are there's 2,000 years of history on these texts. You obviously can't read all of it, but look at a couple decent commentaries. If you're like me and you, you take the time, you do your best uh, to translate the text. Uh, I, I, I can't do that for Peter. Um, this week has been just filled with um, stuff at home, you know, insurance problems and, and, and you know, basically construction stuff. So that means my, my time is very limited. So I wasn't able to, do, I wasn't able to translate the text myself. Last week I did when we, when I preached on the Trinitarian, um, Jesus's Trinitarian construct of baptism in Matthew 28, I translated the text myself. Um, and so I, I think the first thing is if you're able to translate and dive into the text and see what it says, then that is what you need to do. And, you know, of course, do your research, do your, com you know, look at commentaries, look at how, how uh, the author frames the text, you know, look at the syntactical issues, the lexical issues, um, p potential background issues, and all, all those sorts of things. So don't be afraid to do the hard work of actually reading the text in context and trying to discern what the Holy Spirit inspired the author to say. So that's number two. Number three with apocalyptic is you, you simply cannot get away from ro uh, real world application. And what I mean by that is people are on social media, they're um, watching the news, they're reading newspapers. And so at the end of the day, a pastor, um, he or she needs to be, how do you, how do you say this, ne needs to be engaged uh, in culture, not allowing culture to dictate what you preach, but allow, but being culturally aware of what's going on in the world. Um, it's no secret that the book of Revelation has kind of a pride of place. Um, in kind of our, our, our cultural lexicon, you know, 666, or it should be 616, but you know. Uh, and so you can see how very quickly that um, if you're preaching on Revelation, there is a tendency to over-sensationalize things or, you know, predictive prophecy or the Roman Catholic Church is the, you know, this, this, and this. The Mark of the Beast is a credit score, you know, all these sorts of things. And so... Uh, I, I think a minister needs to be just aware of what's in the cultural waters. Um, so that's part of it as well, is basically recognizing for point number three that these texts are written 2,000 years ago, and they speak today, and they are applicable today. But that doesn't mean uh, they fit into a specific scheme. Uh, more often than not, apocalyptic literature is dealing with kind of two key themes. One is essentially the problem of divine activity, or lack thereof, kind of the the how long, O Lord. And the second aspect of it is dealing with um, hope and perseverance in the midst of apostasy, idolatry, and immorality. And so you, you have the literature essentially pushing people towards faithfulness or trying to extol them into, the vir into virtue and righteousness, <coughs> excuse me, while dealing with, you know, the cosmos around them. And so um, these texts are vital, they are necessary, and I think they have a lot to say to our world but they require care so that they don't become props or at worst in my eyes, a lot of these texts becomes a me become a means to, to an end for a, a pastor to get up there and talk about whatever thing he or she wants to talk about. And at the end of the day, um, a text is not a springboard into talking about something you want to talk about. It is the word of God to be served to the people of God, whether that's a difficult meal to swallow or if it's a wonderful feast, like at most Baptist potlucks, you know, so those are kind of three three uh, kind of key things or key, key kind of interpretive practices when preaching apocalyptic. Um, number four, just as a final note, would be um, reminding people that the Bible's weird. Um, it, it is like it's it's two thousand. It's written over two thousand about two thousand years ago, and you're le it, it's it's not written to you. It doesn't have you in mind when writing it. Um, it doesn't. It's not written to people that have you know cars and Wi-Fi and Amazon Prime. Uh, you know, boats and, 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 you know, digitized money, you know, paychecks like that and, and all that sort of stuff. Like there's just none of that. And they're not writing to modern people. It doesn't mean we demythologize and all of that, but it does mean that there is cultural um, translation that has to happen. You can't just pick up the Bible, drop it in front of someone and be like, here's everything you ever need to know about anything. You know, it, it requires interpretation. It requires engagement. And it requires, um, honestly, faith-seeking understanding. And um, a minister worth his or her salt will take that seriously, especially if you have people in your congregation that I do in mine that are very smart, 
and they ask good questions and they want to know what the word says. They don't want to just be kind of spoon fed. They want to actually feast on the word. And so those four, um, uh, those are kind of four suggestions I've offered to folks in dealing with um, preaching apocalyptic texts. Uh, hopefully those are helpful to you. And let's, let's apply this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'll be preaching this text on Sunday. And this is from uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 22. And I'll read it to you um, just right now. And I just realized I don't have the Greek text in front of me. Give me one sec to pull that up. Um, but I'll read in English from the uh, updated NRSV, which at the end of the day, I'm satisfied with that, uh, the NRSV. But I, uh, I, I have quibbles with it, as I do with any translation. I think they... For example, I think they get wrong um, numerous texts on sexual ethics. You know, 1 Corinthians 6, um, uh, 9 through 11, I think they just botched that one. I didn't, I, I think the lexical and uh, theological evidence of, of the influence of the Septuagint on Paul is fairly obvious. Um, so I, I don't think they did well on that. But um, overall, I, I, that's the translation I usually use. So here's what you have. This, this text follows up on the the previous house defense you know the household code household code you know wives submit to your husbands husbands love your wives you know peter has one excuse me and then you have kind of a nice little parenthetical from verses 8 to 12 uh with old testament citations it looks like um and you, you've got language about kind of a mini fruits of the spirit you know loving one another and then you get into an interesting bit of discourse here and often in apologetic circles 1 Peter 3.15 is kind of the key text, um, kind of, you know, uh, uh, for how to engage with people. And so let me just read the text for us. Um, now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for, what, for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it, in ge do it with gentleness and respect. Maintain a good conscience so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ might be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered. Uh, some ancient texts I remember um, I do have died. Uh, I don't have the text, uh, the textual variant material in front of me, but um, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the, in the flesh, but made alive in or by the Spirit, in which or, or in whom, depending on who, if that's the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, you wouldn't say which, you know, in whom also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight lives, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Uh, and as we say at my church, the word of the Lord. And so already, we'll kind of break this up into two. Um, you have verses 13 through 17 as kind of a, a, a discourse on, on suffering and what it means. You have some rhetorical questions that sound very Pauline to us, but it's, it's, you know, it's a very common way of speaking. So verses 13 through 17, I would kind of separate from 18 through 22, not like hard separation, like, you know, put a chapter division, but just for, in terms of conversation. Um, but notice the context. The context uh, is not apologetics, although it is certainly applicable to apologetics. It is focused on suffering or the issue of, of doing right and being maligned. And very often, a lot of, especially in the ancient world, you were, you know, it was not as simple as just going out there and spreading the gospel and just having conversations with people at coffee shops. It was oftentimes a matter of life or death. It, it required care. It, re it required cultural intelligence. And so a lot of people today have no problem with that. You know, we, we, we understand how to have conversations. Back then, you had to be very careful who you talked to and how you talked to them. Uh, you have issues of honor and shame. You have issues of, of gender, um, you know, power dynamics, and not like the critical sense, but, you know, there's differences in status and stuff like that. And so um, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And so it's a rhetorical 
question, but actually doesn't seem to have a, a strong answer in either direction. Um, it seems to imply that if someone hurts you for doing good, they're a bad person, obviously. But the point being is that uh, the hope is, at least, <coughs> excuse me, that no one will hurt you for, be, for doing good things. You know, be a good citizen. Uh, then verses uh, 14, um, but even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed, i.e. invert, uh, i.e. you are um, uh, blessed or blessed. You know, the, the same uh, lexeme is used, I believe, uh, in, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you know, the Beatitudes, you know, uh, blessed are, so-and-so. Um, do not be afraid, uh, do not be afraid, uh, do not fear their threats, but uh, do not be frightened or do not be troubled in that. But uh, sanctify or make holy, or, you know, hagiadzo, to, to sanctify, set apart, make holy, um, you know, consecrate, you know, show reverence to um, Christ as Lord. And so you have this kind of nice little uh, parallel. Uh, if you do suffer for doing right, you are blessed. You are to see yourself as blessed are, you know, the poor, the meek, the broken. Um, don't fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. To do this in reverence for Christ. And so that's language of kind of cultural submission or cultural yielding or deference. And, you know, rather than turning the other, rather than, you know, waging war, carrying your strap and, you know, busting a cap in people, you know, and fighting people, the point is more a matter of cultural deference. When they malign you, can't consider that a blessing. You're being maligned not because of your honor or shame. You're being maligned because of your allegiance to King Jesus. And that is worth being maligned for. There are things that are not worth being maligned for. That is certainly one of them. Uh, and we are in our hearts to do so, sanctifying Christ as Lord. And that, it's interesting here, not with your lips, in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. That is, show reverence for Christ in your hearts. That is kind of the idea of the Hebraic it, it idea. Um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so getting Christ right as Lord, Christologically, uh, specifically Lord as probably a reference to the Septuagint use of kurios as, um, as, the, as, as, the, as the translation of Yahweh, um, right, and I, in the in the Old Testament, um, to treat Christ as the pinnacle over all things in which you are having a discussion on. Christ is at the center of all of it, and you are not to be afraid. And so, uh, then you continue on here. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do so with gentleness and respect, because of course Christ was gentle, and he was uh, shown to be a deeply to to engage in a loving manner. And then maintain a good conscience so that you are so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for a good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. Basically, at the end of the day, you are to be righteous no matter what they do to you. You are to be a Christian. You are to be kind. You are to be deferential. You are to be loving in a way that Christ was loving. Um, and is but you know. And the interesting bit here is. Um, Suffering, it, it seems to imply in verse 17, that suffering is not part of God's will per se. For it is better, <coughs> excuse me, for it is better or stronger or nobler even uh, to, to suffer for doing good than doing evil. Um, and you have this interesting little uh, kind of clause here. If theloi ta thelema tu theu, you know, if, um, uh, if, uh, Trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, sorry, I started goofing around. Um, the will of God, basically, is this, is basically it's, it, it seems to suggest that there's a conditional particle here, the if, uh, seems to suggest that not all suffering is part of God's will. And even then, it's debatable whether any suffering is part of God's will. You know, what he desired in the first place in Genesis. And so 317 actually might be suggestive of the idea that um, all suffering is part of God's will or desire. And of course, you know, I'm not going to go down the, the two, uh, what we might call the, the two wills of God or in God reading. I, I, I think that's absolutely unnecessary. Um, and I don't have a theological motivation for doing so. And so it just simply seems to suggest that suffering is a conditional, uh, suffering in terms of God will is conditional and not always certain. So suffering could be of the devil. There's no reason why that has to be, has to be applied to God. And so uh, suffering, pasco, you know, the, the standard, you know, kind of verb here, at least in the infinite, it's, it's an infinitive. It's better to, it is good, or it is more noble to, in doing good, if indeed the will of, uh, if indeed the will of the, in the will of, you know, to, to actively engage with God's will, 
uh, to suffer for then doing evil. And so uh, already here you have human agency and divine activity. Yeah. Um, uh, agatha poeo, right? So you have a compound, you know, good or beauty, uh, um, and then poeo, or, uh, which is a verb, you know, to do, to make. But this refers to right doing, moral activity. And so both are in the active tense, in the sense of we are to do good things, and if suffering occurs, um, it is not always a part of God's will. God is not, you know, coercing people to act badly towards us or predetermining that. It seems to suggest that um, oftentimes people do bad things because they are bad people and not because God did that that way. And so that gives us a little bit of a theodicy there in terms of human freedom. So for my apologetically minded friends, you have that issue right there, which I think is you know, very interesting. And so preaching this, you know, th uh, 13 through 17, um, I would say just by means of, and I'm not sure I'll say all this on Sunday, um, but you know, that the concept will be there is the idea that um, suffering is, is part of the, is just simply part of reality. You can't hide from it. You can't buy your way out of it. You can't bribe your way out of it. You can't cajole your way out of it. You are stuck with suffering because suffering is a part of life. But you have Christ. Specifically in verse 18, it follows the suffering of Christ. And Christ is also used uh, throughout the New Testament as, a, as the one who suffers with humankind. Excuse me. Uh, you know, specifically, this suffering language is used in Matthew to discuss. Um, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, Matthew 16, 21, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So suffering for us, for the Christian, is part of life and is to be seen in imitation of Christ. And that is something I think we deeply need to remember, uh, that the Son of Man came to suffer. And suffering, of course, is a part of death itself, uh, as we kind of go through that. I mean, Acts 3.18, uh, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. And so there's that aspect as well, just dealing with suffering. And then, of course, you have the language, I recall, of 1 Corinthians 12.26. If a single member or a member uh, suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Suffering is part of the Christian experience because we not only recognize, it's part of the Christian experience because we recognize that the world is a horrific place in many ways. It has gone off its moorings. It's not what God desires. But we have the hope that Christ as Lord will come back one day to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. And indeed, uh, Philippians 1 says this, right? For I, it has been grant, granted to you or gifted to you for, uh, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him or to suffer for his sake. And so we are basically called into suffering. And the early church had this very deep model of that. So for Christians and for the Christian proclamation of, of the first half of this passage, I would strongly emphasize um, that when you suffer, don't view it as God forcing you or cajoling you or punishing you. View it as a means to draw nearer to the one who suffered for you and suffers with you. And specifically, whether through death, through, through difficulties in life, through isolation and anxiety, um, the Spirit of God is with us, and we are not to be um, left alone in the world. Specifically, that when we are maligned, those who abuse you may be put to shame, but we don't put them to shame. That is, we don't act in retaliation. So I think Peter is drawing, you know, being a good disciple is just drawing off the teachings of Jesus. Turn the other cheek. You know, view it as a badge of honor because we don't, we don't act the way the world does. And that's a call to Christian ethics is that when we look at the world, we see the world as a place of depravity, darkness, and death, but that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to save the world, that whoever believes in him might have, might, you know, have life everlasting. And so that already kind of constructs the more apocalyptic section that will follow, you know, crystal, you know the Christological aspects of it. And so, um, but it begins with suffering, and it begins with understanding the role of suffering in the Christian life. And we should see it not as something to be pursued, like, yeah, let's go suffer for Jesus, but recognize that God is not behind all of our sufferings, but he is the one who suffers with us. And I think that gets us beyond the pale of the problem of evil in many respects and also places the burden of sin rightly on those who do not do the will of God.
And so that's how I would kind of formulate or preach or kind of construct uh, the first part of 1 Peter 3. And then the next part, the, for people, I, I can already hear people chomping at the bit of this or chomping on the bit for this. For Christ also suffered for sins, and starting verse 18, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive, I would argue, by the Spirit, and that would be the Holy Spirit. Um, we'll get there. In whom or in which also he went, or through whom or in whom he went also, or went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, already spirit and spirits. You have a nice little parallel there. Who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight lives were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience um, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, or sovereignties, and powers made subject to him. So already um, we moved from kind of an ethical exhortation to apocalyptic, which is, you know, as often as I mentioned earlier, um, apocalyptic is deeply concerned with ethics. And so there's that. So it's like you can't really separate the two. So Christ suffered uh, or yeah, suffered uh, once for all, so suffered once for sin. So hapax, uh, specifically a once in terms of a um, singular event. And so some people will already argue that, oh, well, this uh, should be seen as a once for all. That is all people. That puts, I think, too much stress on hapax. But the next clause, righteous for the unrighteous, does give the text a universal scope. So uh, he died once for all concerning sin. And so his death is the way in which one, in a, in a one-off event um, does this uh, in regards to sin or for, or for sins. And so already it's not just sin, it's sins, it's in the plural. And so this death, this once-off death makes atonement for sins, and it's an and it's an, an indefinite kind of construct. It's not meant to be taken um, in an isolated or singular fashion. is meant to be representative, and uh, specifically, you have the suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, and so you have that kind of exchange or interchange language, both playing off the language of dikaios uh, and. Um, uh, adikos, you know, judge just for unjust or righteous for unrighteous. And of course, unrighteous there is indefinite. And I would say it probably is exhaustive, meaning that it is for all of the unrighteous because unrighteous is a class. It is a group of people marked out as unrighteous. So the singular dies for the many. So this already feels very, you know, for those of you who know your gospels and your, and your, uh, uh, I was I was gonna say Q sayings, but they're not Q. I don't believe in Q. Our, our gospel sayings: the Son of Man came to give His life as a ransom for many. And of course, Paul says the same thing in one Timothy two through four, or two uh, verses two through or four through six. You know, to give His life as a give His life as a ransom for all. And who pair there is is, is um, substitutionary in some sense, but also probably going off the issue or the, the notion of exchange or interchange, as, as Morna Hooker has, has very famously argued. And so here you have death concerning sin, a once-off death of the, right, of, the, of the righteous. So Christ died once, the righteous one, for sins for the unrighteous. And so it kind of has this nice little parallel here, and it's meant to be exhaustive. So I would say this text does support what we might call a universal atonement, or an, an indefinite atonement, because the unrighteous and the sins are plural and undefined, uh, specifically for the unrighteous. And would we say that the people reading Paul or Paul Peter's letter here are unrighteous? Probably not. Um, I don't get that impression. This is a letter written to Christians. You know, it doesn't mean everyone there is in Christ, but the, the audience does have that. You know, it is written presumably to Christians. And so the death here is probably not spoken of for them. He died in the sense of it's an aorist tense, um, but that aorist tense probably denotes something more like what we might call, it might emphasize the hotbox element, the once. At, but the whole death is viewed uh, as a singular event. And it's not about past tense, it's about the singularity of the event, but that's brought through by the hotbox use of once or once for all or something like that. And so taken all together, 
uh, this text actually seems to support a universal atonement for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, as we might say, Romans 5a, you know, Christ died for the ungodly. And here it's so that he might bring, he might bring us to God. And so you have the language of us here, uh, but us is also indefinite. Us probably refers primarily to Christians, but anyone hearing this who's not a Christian would probably hear this and go, oh, bringing us to God. And so there's that element as well. Um, being put to death in the flesh, he was made alive by spirit. And so pneumati here is dative. Uh, I would take this, and you're not, uh, this is not all the, uh, this all doesn't go in the sermon. I'm more just trying to go through the text together. It's a dative, so it could refer to by the spirit or through, you know, kind of have an agentival or instrumental mentality through the spirit. Um, there's no uh, article there, but that doesn't really matter. Um, there's no article there for, for sarky or for sarks or flesh um, or anything like that. Uh, there's no article for Christ even. And uh, the, in the in the one, two, in a few clauses earlier, it's just Christos, you know, so there's no article there. So articles in Greek are notorious. They can maybe highlight something, but very rarely do they. They're usually used for emphasis, but not. it's not a strict um, hard rule on that. And so here you have Christ offering what we might call a universal atonement for the unrighteous, for sins, in order to bring us to God. That is the human race, I would take. I would take it probably as a reference to the human race, to bring us close to God. Um, being put to death uh, in the flesh, but being made alive through the Spirit. And so death, of course, being a um, death dealer, so death being a sort of power or principality, verse 18 and verse 22 seem to be very coordinate. Uh, you have the language of resurrection, specifically in verse 21, that carries on into verse 22. Uh, who is in heaven at the right hand of the Father and uh, has subordinated all of these principalities and powers, angels, sovereignties, and powers. And so death being kind of representative of the initial element of that. Um, so resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, bookends verses 18 and verse 22, and it thus shapes the entire passage. So Christ essentially is at war with these death powers, these anti-God powers, as uh, Beverly Gaventa has rightfully said. So it turns out Peter's just as apocalyptic as Paul. And so in which or through whom, depending on how you take spirit, if you think made alive in spirit, you know, that's already, I don't, I don't agree. I don't like that language. I think in the spirit probably makes best, I think makes best sense that this Holy Spirit was involved in the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, in whom, so, or through whom, en ho, so you have, you know, uh, if the Spirit did it, then you wouldn't say in which or in it. You would say, continue the language of through whom. So the Spirit, did, he was made alive through whom he also, or even went to and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, or proclaimed to the spirits in prison. And of course, spirits here is not, um, is not uh, in the Spirit. These are actual entities. These are probably, probably, the, well, we know what, Peter calls them. These are spirits. These are pro this is probably a reference to the sons of God or the Nephilim in Genesis chapter one, as we see also in the book of one Enoch, one Enoch six chapter six or nine, with those sort of the watchers, and those various entities and powers. And so, being uh, after which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison who are in prison, and so prison here, of course. <coughs> Uh, Fulake, uh, prison you know, can be just a regular prison, or it could be probably, probably has a reference to the underworld. Um, and it, and you have this language in verse 20 of, uh, to those who formerly did not um, expect or did not obey, so they did not formally, at one time or formally, they did not obey. Um, but in the, when God's patience, uh, or, you know, uh, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being made, uh, in which a few people, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. And of course here you have diasodzo, that is saved through, or spare, or deliverance. Here, interestingly, I actually don't think verse 20, verse being brought safely through water, uh, is a reference to eschatological salvation. It's certainly apocalyptic in some sense, but in a temporal sense. That is, it's focused on what we might call human existence. It's not focused entirely on what we have at the eschaton. Although, like I said, I don't. I think there's prefiguration, but I don't think it's a hard prefiguration. 
So you are safe through water. So water is the means is probably the means by which you are saved. Um, but you are actually uh, it's probably I think probably more likely because that would create a, a grammatical repetition, which you have probably here is um, eight souls or persons sukai uh, saved th delivered through water or delivered through the water. So it's not even that water itself saves them. It's they were delivered through it kind of as you would say, um, I made it through, I swam through the water to get to safety. Water itself didn't carry me to safety. I was pulled through the waters or I swam through the waters to safety. So it has, um, it's not instrumental. Dia is not functioning um, instrumentally. It functions more um, what we might call, um, uh, there, uh, I'm trying to think of, there's a very specific construct with Dia, but I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But anyway, the <coughs> uh, fact that you have Dia Sozo um, is used uh, throughout the New Testament about eight times. Um, uh, people being saved uh, through um, touching the fringe of his garment uh, to come to be saved for his servants, you know, stuff like that. So um, this, this language has the aspect of physical healing or being brought safely uh, through a, a shipwreck. Um, interestingly, it doesn't actually seem... Yeah, in every context, it doesn't actually seem to be used in the New Testament in an eschatological or apocalyptic sense. It usually refers to the saving of life, you know, being delivered through something. And so here, I think they were. I think um, it's probably more accurate to say in verse three twenty that they were saved. They were brought safely through water. So water itself is not the means of their salvation. The ark is. The ark is what saved them, so to speak. And we see that in verse twenty, because then you have, and this. Uh, and baptism, which this corresponds to now, saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. Uh, yeah, and baptism now, and the, and the question, of course, is, you know, where do you take now? And this now is an antitype. Baptism now saves you, so it's difficult to put the, the now. Where does now go? But what is clear, I think, in verses 21, in baptism, which is now prefigured, now saves you. Or delivers you in the same way, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And here's where it gets. And this is where I think the interesting aspect is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so water is not the means by which you are saved because you are, you are delivered through the water. And you're kind of moving through it. Here you have baptism being used as a type. And, and, and it even seems to put a bit of emphasis because, you know, you're not worried about the removal of dirt from the body like washing. It actually seems to depersonalize or deliteralize the metaphor of baptism. And I'm not saying that or the sacramentality of it because the focus is on a clear conscience or a, a good conscience um, toward God. Because so the issue is not being washed. It's about having a proper attitude towards God. And that happens through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so um, the parallel, it's, you don't have a parallel between water and Christ here. You have a parallel of the ark, of Christ being the ark, the resurrection of Christ being more parallel to the ark, not the water. So brought safely through the water is the same way of speaking of Christ brought, um, Christ now brings you safely through everything else. And we see that actually in verse 22, um, what are you brought safely through? Angels, authorities, and powers. Christ specifically has subordinated them, specifically hupatasso, to place under his feet, to subordinate. And so um, water being, of course, a symbol of chaos in the Old Testament, I think, I think Peter is actually simply drawing off that reality. Um, and you have the angels and the, the specific powers and stuff like that as well. Um, the sovereignties, the realms, death being that sort of reality too. And so I think, I think that actually makes good sense, and that's how I would personally argue it. Um, uh, you have uh, si similar parallels in Jude as well, you know, um, uh, our, you know praise to, to God, only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So sovereignty there, um, and so on and so forth. Um, Christ is the head over or head of every rule and, and, and authority. Um, and so I, I think that actually makes better sense. Um, the text is still apocalyptic. Christ made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, um, specifically, <coughs> excuse me, specifically to illustrate his sovereignty over them. 
uh, it's not the language used here is proclaim or preach or tell um, specifically the it's not always the gospel that is preached judgment is also preached as well and so I think taking it here um, there's no evidence of what happens after that um, the deluge you know Peter moves into the deluge of what happens and uses the language of baptism but here I think you have a um, specific conversation about how that works but wherever Christ is proclaimed as his heart is sanctified as Lord we are not to worry about the spirits we're not to worry about death we're not wor to worry about angels principalities and powers or angels authorities and powers because we have the resurrection of Christ and baptism which is the uh, appeal to God for a good conscience we don't worry about the literal literalism of baptism Water. We worry about what baptism instantiates within us. It gives us a new paradigm how to view things. It's the language of being clothed with Christ in Galatians 3.27. And so preaching this is actually, I think, once you kind of don't hide from the, uh, the craziness of the passage, and I mean craziness positively. Oh, the kiddos are running out from a music class, I can see. <laughs> um, you have the language of faithfulness, God's patience, um, in verses 20. You have Christ making a proclamation over the, the fallen enemies, the imprisoned guards, so to speak, the, the spirits, the entities, the, the, the sinful entities that were formerly um, sinful and did not obey. Um, you have Christ being kind of representative of the ark and bringing people through the waters and his resurrection is the means by which we are saved. Specifically, he's made alive in the spirit or by the spirit, uh, as opposed to the spirits that are in prison right now. Uh, Christ has proclaimed his lordship over them, specifically over the angels, authorities, and powers that have been subordinated to him, where he sits in heaven at God's right hand. And so uh, essentially the argument or the, the sermon would be focused on the Christ that we have as Christians and tying it together, we do not suffer as those who are without Christ. Because we have Christ, we do not suffer in the way others suffer. We suffer uh, righteously. We suffer um, with love for them. We suffer as a means of gentleness to show them the way of, of Christ. Uh, and we do this with gentleness and respect because that's what Christ did. And we also recognize in verse 18 specifically that Christ suffered once for sins and, you know, and for sin, the righteous. And so our understanding is Christ suffered death for the person who is persecuting or abusing or being rude to me. Or, or having that sort of mentality or reaction. So I think this text is actually far more grand, far more cosmic, far more apocalyptic than a lot of apologists might consider. It also asserts that any principality, power, ideology, or construct in our cosmos is ultimately being put under the feet of Jesus. And then at the end of days, um, who will you profess your lordship to? The subordinated powers doomed to annihilation or to the one who is lord over all things and is lord now? So you have that issue as well. And so that's how um, preaching apocalypse, how I would one, preach the text and how I plan on at least beginning to preach it this coming Sunday at First Baptist Church of Palos Verdes here in Los Angeles. And we'll see what happens. But I, I hope this is helpful to you, just getting, hopefully getting you a bit of a sense of how to preach apocalyptic texts and what that might look like. Um, for those who care, my, my reading prob I, I heard this reading a while back. My guess is my reading is very similar to Michael Heiser, um, the late uh, great um, Old Testament theologian. Um, so I'm probably close to him. Um, but for you, what is something in the passage that stands out to you, whether you're a pastor, a theologian, apologist? Um, let me know if I've helped solve anything or created more questions. I'd appreciate it. I, I'm not so far up in my ivory tower that I cannot be persuaded of other things. Um, but yeah, hopefully this video is helpful to you. If you uh, like it, make sure you, well, I guess like it, uh, share, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. Uh, if you have an extra few bucks in uh, this wonderful, stable American economy, you can become a patron. Uh, and all the links of that are in the description. But uh, at the end of the day, um, don't run from the text. Don't hide from it. Um, respect it enough to engage with it and engage the questions that come from it. And when you do so, I think you'll begin to see that these apocalyptic texts, these difficult texts, these weird texts, suddenly have a lot to say to the Church of Jesus Christ. So, the Lord be with you, and God bless.